Um, so shipwrecks and forts on Sahel coast. You know, with the theme of the conference here on um, you know bastions and wood. Um, unfortunately, most of the wood that we're talking about in the work that's been going on in the last few years um, has rotted away um, because it's under the water and we only have the stone parts of it left. But on the coastal uh, plain and the coastline, we have a lot of all of these uh, fantastic stone forts, and I'll talk a little bit about those. I really hope the presentation is going to be about uh, trying to understand the, the maritime coastal heritage. So I'm going to be talking about stuff that's under the water and stuff that's above the water. Um, I got involved in this, uh, dragged into it uh, by Ted Pollard, uh, while he was at the um, British Institute in East Africa a number of years ago. And uh, our colleague in Tanzania, and I'll just uh, use his, uh, the name he actually likes to go by, which is Itchy, um, who has been working with Ted for a number of years on these sites. And uh, the, 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 the projects have grown from a lot of Ted's PhD and many years ago now, probably Ted. Um, the uh, projects have grown from looking at uh, wreck sites to looking at uh, the archaeology of the, the really the archaeology of how the peoples have developed along these coast, coastal corridors, and it's linking all of this into a, a bigger picture about maritime archaeology all around the Indian Ocean. So I'll come through that sort of theme. As, as we're starting to uh, uh, to go through the talk, um, but before I get started, one of the things that I, I, I really want to emphasise, and I'll come back to right at the end of the talk, here, is that you know, to us when we're looking at coastal heritage and maritime heritage, you know, and we're looking at this still often in this incredible colonial <coughs> viewpoint, you know, that what we think of as the heritage of these places is not necessarily what the locals think. Of and that's a really important thing in a lot of this kind of work in what is now called ODA countries, developing countries. But it's a really important thing to keep on bearing in mind because, of course, you know, what we think about is important to preserve. It's not necessarily what they think about as important to preserve in terms of heritage. And what we're trying to do with a lot of these projects is, is, is a two-way understanding, a two-way understanding of you know, our, what we think, looking in is important. And of course, in Tanzania, you've got world heritage sites like the East Stone Town in Zanzibar, and the one I always talk about, which is Kilwatsuani and Nisanda Manara. But the locals who lost them, even the people who are living right in the heritage, living in the world heritage areas, they just look blankly at you when you see talk about their sites, their homes, as being their own heritage, about their maritime culture, be it tangible or intangible, being important, you know, world important internationally important heritage, they just look blankly at you. I mean to them their heritage is the sea. Their heritage is the bale of the tree. So we've got to be very careful when we go into these places and start working with local communities and thinking about um, heritage investigation heritage and, and ultimately heritage preservation, heritage management. Because we've got to do that in a sympathetic way with local communities. We need their help and I'll come back to that. So we're going to go to the Tanzanian coast. Um, this has been trade recorded along the Swahili coast past two millennia, probably much, much longer than that, um, if we, once we get really looking into it. It's very much dominated in the, in the, the maritime heritage in terms of boats and, and trade routes, is dominated by the, uh, the, the monsoon and the winter versus summer wind uh, orientation of dominant wind direction. So you can see there in the, in the winter time that we get this sort of swirling around from the Indian Ocean. All the ships have come down bearing goods from uh, the Indian subcontinent down that, that East African coast during the winter, and then they all go back up in the summertime when the wind directions change. Um, so the seasonal reverse of mon monsoon uh, provides a reliable sailing conditions, and that, that helps to, us to understand some of the places that we might be looking at, how we look at different trade, and therefore wrecks uh, associated with that. Um, in the part of the, of the world that we're talking about here, first millennium AD, very much dominated by the trade from the Gulf and Western India. And then as you're going through um, that time period, of course, it's, it's all about the, uh, particularly the Gulf and, and slave trade, the Arab slave trade that's going down. I'm not going to dwell on that today. Um, Kilwa Kisawani, and you can see Kilwa here, um, down on the, um, uh, so halfway down the, the, the East African 
helps there. We found, of course, the bottom end of Tanzania. Kilokas Kutsilwani started to make was established in about the 11th century. And uh, we can see lots of Far East pottery starting to come in, particularly in Gordon between the 13th and 14th century. Uh, they start to dominate in the gold trade in and out of the area. Um, and as I say, very later on, um, it, it built into the slave trade as well. European arrival in this part of the world, uh, we see a steady influence from about the 14, mid, well, late 1400s on, um, and particularly with the, the Portuguese movement. So the way we uh, approach this, this coastal maritime zone is not just using one kind of way to investigate it, as it were. Um, we're very keen on, on finding shipwrecks, and, and, and that's key to the trade that's going on. But uh, a lot of work in its tidal surveys, in terms of looking at the, the, the writings, and particularly a lot of etchings to try and understand the traditional vessels that were being used at this time. And of course, you know, building towards now, we're also interested in the ethnographic evidence, modern practices of boat building, traditional crafts, etc. Um, and all of that really before we get to, to what we kind of like to do in warm and clear waters, which is get out of the water and dive on the surface. So I'm going to take you through all of those things to get to, to what we um, really want to do, which is, is get in the water and find things. Um, there are a lot of nice, great wrecks all up and down the coast that have been found, um, particularly by, uh, this is work by Caesar Rita uh, out of Kenya, um, <coughs> that, that we, can, we can go back to, so we're not doing new things in, in this. Ted and uh, Itchu a number of years ago came up with a sort of an evaluation of the potential for Tanzania to give us um, information on this sort of shipping trade, etc. And the number of wreck sites were already known, this is back in 2015-2016, number of wreck sites known. And I'm going to take us today down to that box area, the Kilwaki Savani area, where we've got a complex um, rear or a complex system of estuaries <coughs> coming out through um, a number of islands and we know that this is a an important place to go because trade and trade coming in and out of the Kilwa, Kisawan, and port areas was very, very important. So it's a place that we would expect to find a lot of, uh, of information, and uh, this was the starting point for all of that. The, um, the starting point in terms of us looking for things, of course, is uh, to go back to the, to the old charts. And this is one from 1775 um, that the French had made on uh, the island of what we now call Kilwaki Savani. Um, I really wanted this to uh, uh, not be as north up north, it's actually to the right here. And um, Kilwaki Savani in the port uh, itself got up about a <coughs> And a number of features, I'm going to show you the anchorage in here, uh, features, uh, features in the, in the near shore in there, if I highlight where they are, um, we, we believe are already wreck sites. So this, um, Already they're being noted back in the 1700s. We're going to concentrate on this zone in here when we get to uh, the intertidal and into the uh, submerged uh, investigations. So, before we do that, the intertidal, well, some of the, the, the French maps are on the Dinner of this, um, indicates that the mighty wrecks along the Tour, this is the main entrance into the Kilokasuani area uh, from the Indian Ocean out here. And uh, like most of these places, it's got a coral platform, and of course these coral platforms are quite treacherous if you're trying to come in and navigate in uh, into these in, in stormy conditions. Um, they're just focusing in on that. You can see the, the front of the coral, um, the front of the coral reef in here, and some uh, interesting features on, on that coral reef platform. And just Ted surveying that coral reef platform, and surveying it in the intertidal because as you walk uh, along these places, uh, you can start to see that, that, that there has been, um, well, there, there are evidences of, of, uh, of, of things like uh, occupation and evidences of the uh, washing up of materials on the shoreline here. So um, on this side you see uh, actually these are bits of scattered of pottery on them coming out of the, uh, the shorelines. And as we get into looking at the, on that, on that coral platform in here, uh, then you also see scatterings of things in these little uh, hollows between the upstanding coral. And this site in particular here, at a, at a place called Ilwala Yahezi, and a Jahezi is a type of boat that is used in this part of the world, a wooden <coughs> ship. Um, and in fact, this huge rock of the, of the boat type Jahezi in the local language of Swahili there. And of course, this rock upstanding has a, a kind 
in the boat like a shape. The more intriguing, more interesting. So that's what calls people <coughs> scattered all over here. And so you've got the, the uh, typical form of coral and all these black blocks or something else that are in there. And it turns out these black blocks are all like form of basalt, which means they're, they're almost peridotite. They're, they're incredibly dense, and of course, they are what we expect, which is ballast. And if you walk amongst the reef there, you see um, not just the, the, the dark rock, which is the, um, the, the, the basalt, or the, uh, the type, type basalt in here, but we've got blocks of sandstone, that's what proves natural to a coral reef. You've got blocks of quartzite, you've got metamorphic rocks in here, in fact, even blocks of granite stuff to show. So, certainly a mixed assemblage of ballast material, which is non native to anywhere within the district. And in fact, um, this type of, of peridotite is only found in, in very, very uh, few places along that East African coast. It's kind of similar to what you say about you know, the, the armored ballast at the lizard point. So the lizard is it removed from like uh, peridotite that um, is very good for basalt. That is the same thing about this. You only find these in certain places. So it's already starting to tell us about where things are coming from. The pottery itself is scattered amongst it. We've got some here. In this case, 10th century Persian pottery, uh, uh, this set up here, um, and then again, some little bits of uh, yeah, coral erupting stone, etc. So, just scattered amongst the reef in these tidal surveys, you're starting to get a feel for what, what might have come out of what we think, in this case, a ship that did get wrecked and was torn apart on the reefs. All that's left is this kind of material <coughs> that's been hung up in that. In that um, complex reef structure. So uh, other types of uh, information about what's going on here, and you can see now this is uh, unfortunately um, very hard to make out, but uh, we've got the reproduction of it. Um, this is some of the uh, etchings that can be found on rocks and in different uh, monuments on the intersidal areas and in the, in, in the uh, uh, it, well this one is actually in, um, in Kenya. But we have our own ones from Kilwa Kisawani here. Unfortunately, there's been some damage to this one up here. It's been some modern chipping of the uh, of the action. We're not really sure why, but uh, characteristic uh, boats of of the the, um, the early Swahili period, and and that's what they kind of look like today. This is one of the uh, Jahazi uh, boats that's still in use today, and still produced on this on this particular part. Of and in fact, the, um, the boat that goes on today, this is one that uh, is being constructed at the moment. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think it was hewn down with a picture of about two and a half weeks ago of it being um, uh, recreated, hewn out using traditional methods. Um, that was Bagamoyo, which is north, north, north of Dallas. <coughs> um, in fact, these were just the Bagamoyo themselves here. Uh, used for fishing today. This particular one is going to be used as a, as a dead one. Finish the demonstration, it's going to be used as a sort of tourist boat in that part of the world. But that's the, if you want the ethnological sort of background to some of this, these crafts survive today in these communities in terms of uh, what they're doing and haven't really changed um, probably for millennia in how they're working. So to get to the Hill of Kisimani site itself, this is World Heritage Site, this is a Portuguese representation. Probably uh, nothing like it really was when it was uh, under Portuguese control. Um, this is hearsay in terms of somebody painting it on an oral description of the site. Um, the remains today is the Great Palace and uh, the Great Mosque, this is what remains on the site today within the World Heritage. And it's unfortunate that this community, well, it's not fortunate this community is living in this area, but the robbing of these stones is something that is constantly happening um, for the locals just to build their own homes. They don't necessarily um, see these as of great world heritage status uh, in the same way we do. So there's an education thing that has to go on on these sorts of sites. As with Portuguese, now it's 1500, um, uh, around 1500 date uh, Portuguese fort within the area is again part of this site. But you can see that it's not only been inflicted by uh, erosion into the uh, into the Indian Ocean, or into the estuary of the Indian Ocean here now today, so it's been assaulted from many sides. It's been assaulted by the robbing, it's been assaulted by natural elements in here. So um, that's Kilo Kisawani, and I, I uh, uh, basically 
in the case of the Christian, it, uh, it started the talk there. Um, and what we were trying to do in this case is, is understand the association of the wreck sites, which were um, off the shore uh, here, with this history of the, the actual um, uh, monuments, if you want, themselves. So, addressing that offshore area, um, we, we did that a number of years ago. Um, a very uh, a Keith Robinson set up for a multi beam sonar strapped to the bottom of a wooden boat. So, that's what we've got to work with. Um, and it does work. <coughs> so, here we are, that's the, the site, it's in the back here. This is the multi beam survey of the area. The uh, ballast scatter was over here. And what we were trying to do with this was then identify anywhere within this area <coughs> that we could find evidence of, of, of further wreck sites. So it's, it's looking at the data, looking for anomalies in the data. Uh, those of you who work with this kind of geophysical data will be very familiar with looking at the, these sorts of plots of, of bathymetry, maybe, you know, putting them together in maps, looking at the, the amplitude of the sites down parts of that bathymetry. We are upstanding uh, isolated features. Of course, any isolated feature you see on a on a, on a, uh, a kind of a, um, a similar bottom that doesn't show any features is of interest. So that's the first stage, trying to look at these sorts of things. Look at the patterning. This, in fact, is a fish trap um, that was in the near shore area. Uh, classic patterning <coughs> within the data here, and uh, actually a continuing association with fishing <coughs> used today. So the main geraser of the wasp is, is uh, oh, sorry, the main geraser of the fourth is here, and uh, we certainly saw um, a number of these kind of isolated features offshore from this area where the Namibian wasp is, um, the main wasp down in here, and, and the pallets down at this end of the road. So an association between um, the onshore and what we would have thought would be the port areas offshore. Uh, and this is just one of the, um, the targets upon which we were, or our, the maps for targets upon which we were then wanting divers to go down and, and search and see what's on the bottom. So actually last summer, uh, no, last spring, uh, we went out there and uh, with a team of local divers from the Department of Antiquities um, and the Department of Forestry and Rural Affairs and Marine Conservation, all who have a remit to understand the heritage in Tanzania, um, we went out and, and Talk to them, we uh, trained them in the, the NAS uh, uh, standard way of training, and we uh, uh, we got help from, from the NAS to do this. And a very enthusiastic crew were um, taught in classrooms, uh, in the uh, in around the month in, in practice in the very, very shallow waters, and eventually uh, actually getting onto the site itself to do survey and more survey of what we uh, thought was the um, scatters from wreck sites just off that port area. And sure enough, these are some of the finds that were, were coming up. So ballast, yeah, we've got the ballast uh, in the intertidal, and we've got ballast in the subtidal. Um, large uh, pottery shells, see there, on the floor, and these things, which are, of course, um, the classic type of stone anchor that we see all around the Indian Ocean. This uh, here actually is one that um, is up in the village, Fortunately, uh, Ted was back there last summer and he says he found it and it's been snapped in half. We don't know quite how it's happened and what's happened to that, but this one is still on the sea floor, so it should theoretically be in, in, the, in, in the condition that you can see it there. So, stone anchors, lots of pottery coming up. Um, we've got the antiquity the officers there ready to receive it on the, on the boats with us, so uh, uh, they were directing what they wanted literally from this particular site once they've been recorded on the bottom. And some quite nice um, Indian, Middle Eastern, Persian, I suppose we call them, uh, 13th, 14th century imported ceramics. So it's starting to tell us about these boats and the use of the boats in these areas. Uh, some more 13th, 14th century, what they call Islamic monochrome pottery coming up from the, uh, the sites themselves. So we know that there's, there's a lot of, of, of trade and import in this area. Tying it then into the, uh, through the intertidal to the sites themselves. Uh, we're working with the University of Dar es Salaam, training some of their students in the methodologies that would be used to do this, all under what's now called a, a, um, a sponsorship from the UK government for Global Challenge Research Funding. So this is a way of trying to uh, 
put money back into these places, both into the, uh, the, the governmental, uh, um, the research elements of the research part sectors of the of the country, but also helping to put that money into local communities. It's trying to do that because, we're, as I said at the beginning, we're trying to raise awareness for what we believe is important out there, and at the same time trying to understand what they think is important. But often getting that message across is really, really hard. You know, we, we write lots of academic papers, and how many people actually read those academic papers? Well, you know, quite not that many. I mean, it might be nice to say that I read all these things, but how many people actually have read them? Right, and actually very, very few have read all the ones I've written. Um, and it should uh, came to the same conclusion. And he wasn't getting any traction with the local, local population in what was there. He wasn't getting any traction with the national government. So when it comes to managing and helping preserve these places, he was really hitting a brick wall. Um, so, so he did something which was which was very, very interesting. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish by, by letting you see a bit of this and maybe hear a bit of this. He, he then adopted a completely different approach. So we found all these spots, these, these facts, and we wanted to go and we want to do more out there. And we want to sort of, you know, really get, get um, not just the locals, but the national government engaged with this. And when he did this through the Nikki standard means, we didn't get very far. But he did it through this move uh, on the site that we're working. And uh, you can get onto this, uh, this website that I've come up. Um, and this actually says a lot more about, uh, about the site than I can say myself. So he put this, put all our work, into a rap song. <laughs> and this rap singer has 80,000 people following her in Tanzania. After the production of this rap song, not only now are the whole local community engaged in this project, they now know about their site because youth is seen about it. They know about their site because it's it been shown on national television and they're pop charts. The local buses have played this, the, um, the local media has played this, and it's gone all the way up to in the recent conference that she was at. He had the, the head of the ministry come up to him and say, What can we do about this site? Why, why don't we know about this? It's completely transforming the way that we're engaging with the local community. It's completely transforming the way that we're trying to um, trying to help preserve these sites, not just for us, colonialists going in there, but for the locals. And ultimately, um, you know, it will help their their lives there because when this is national, this is national, there will be tourists in places which aren't known about today. So I'll just um, leave it at that, and then you can go on as with the rest of the song here in your own time. And uh, thank you for your geographic responses, Assistance Students Africa, and most recently, uh, Global Challenge Research Funding. Thank you.